Hi, and welcome back to program analysis. This is part two of this lecture on information flow analysis. In the first part, we've seen what information flow analysis actually is and what it's supposed to do. And what we're doing in this second part is to have a more detailed look into um, an information flow policy, which is basically a way to specify what exactly the analysis is checking and what kind of propagation of information the analysis is supposed to warn us about. Let's get started with the question how actually to define um, these different levels of secrecy. So, so far in the examples that I've used um, in the first part of this lecture, we've basically had two levels of secrecy. One was public, the other one was private. Um, of course, we can generalize this idea. And this is um, what we're going to do next, where we look at a lattice of security labels. So this lattice basically consists of a set of security labels, which are then combined in a way that um, they form a so-called universally bounded lattice. We will see in a second what this means, but intuitively it's a way to define different levels of security and uh, of defining what happens if information that have different uh, levels of security are combined with each other so that you know what level of security you'll get in the combined value. So let's start by showing a few examples of these lattices and then we're going to define formally how a lattice looks like. So the most simple kind of lattice is the one that we have already seen um, informally at least in the previous examples where we have exactly two security classes called high and low. And to express that high means more secret than low, um, I'm pointing um, from high to low using this arrow. So what this arrow notation means is that we are always going from the more secret class to the less secret class. Now, sometimes two classes may not be enough, maybe because you have different levels of people who may have different kinds of information and you just want to have different security levels to represent that, that hierarchy. Um, and one way to do this is to basically define um, multiple such security classes where one is always more secret than the other one. So let's say we have top secret as the most secret one and then we have secret and then there's also confidential And then at the bottom, um, we have public, which would in this case mean information that uh, basically everybody can see. And each of these um, classes um, is stacked on top of each other so that the more secret one um, is at the top. So now maybe this stacked um, set of uh, security labels is still not enough because maybe you want to express sometimes that you need different kinds of permissions in order to see a piece of information and different people or different parts of your program may have different subsets of these permissions. And this is what you can express in a so-called subset lattice, where for example, you may have um, three kinds of permissions ABC, which if you have all of them, um, give us the top security class, or maybe some parts of the program only have some subset of this larger set. So for example, AB, BC, and AC, which are um, at a lower level because you can see you're allowed to see less information if you have only two of these permissions. Of course, you may also have just one of them, which again gives us a lower level. Um, so A and B are both subclasses here of um, AB and similar for the others like this. And then of course, there's also the situation where you do not have the permission to see anything. And this is, um, designated here by this bottom security class, which is sort of the equivalent to low or public, meaning that every part of your program can access this kind of information, um, but it is of course not very secret. So now these nice arrangements of security classes are actually called a universally bounded lattice. And I'm going to now formally define what this actually is. So such a universally bounded lattice is a tuple that um, consists of six parts. 
where we have um, a set of security classes called S. Then we have a partial order between these classes, which I'll denote through um, an arrow. Then we have two um, special elements of the class, namely the lower bound and the upper bound. And then we also have two operations that define how we can combine two security classes into another one, um, namely the least uh, upper bound operator and also the greatest lower bound operator. So let's look into these six um, elements of the tuple in uh, some more detail. And I'll also use the example or one of the examples that we've seen on the previous slide to illustrate all of this. So S, as I said, is the set of security classes. And for example, if we look back at the last lattice that I've shown here, then the set of security classes would be all the nodes in this graph that I've drawn. So ABC, AB, AC, BC, A, B, and C, and the empty set at the end. So this entire set is our set S of security classes. Then next, what I mean by this arrow is um, a partial order on this set of security classes. And this partial order for our example is essentially what I've um, shown here um, in this uh, little figure where um, anything that is below um, a, a different security class is also below according to this partial order. And it's called a partial order um, because not all um, elements of our set of security classes are ordered with respect to that order. So for example, A and B, no, sorry, A, B and B, C are not ordered. We do not know which one is more secure because they are sort of on the, on the same level. That's why it's called a partial order. Next, every uh, universally bounded lattice has a lower bound and an upper bound. So we use this um, symbol here for the lower bound and this other symbol for the upper bound. And you can probably guess what these bounds are for our example. So the lower bound is the special security class that means um, um, yeah, that is the least secret of all the classes and the upper bound is the most secret one, um, which is called ABC. And then finally, we have these two um, operators that are also part of our lattice, namely this one, which is the least upper bound operator. So um, S, um, also the other operator, it's defined on two uh, elements of our set of security classes and then returns another um, element of the set. And intuitively what um, the least upper bound operator is doing is to combine two pieces of information and to tell us what the resulting security class is if we, if we combine two pieces of information that have the two input security classes. So for our example of this um, subset lattice, the least upper bound operator is actually the union operator. So we're taking the union of the sets. So for example, if um, we are combining information that has um, security class AB with some information that has security class A, then the resulting piece of information will have class AB. Or if we are, def if we are combining um, something that um, is um, yeah, in this lower bound with something that has AC, then the result will be AC. And then the up uh, other operator that we are also um, defining here for this tuple is the greatest lower bound operator.
which again is a binary operator. So it takes two, um, two security classes and returns another one. And for our example um, of the subset lattice, this operator is actually the intersection. So for example, if um, we take security class ABC and security class C, then the result using this greatest lower bound operator will be security class C. So to illustrate this idea of uh, universally bounded lattices and to check whether um, it was clear, let's have a little quiz where I'm basically showing you four things that might be a university, a universally bounded lattice. And the question for you is whether it actually is one. So I'm just drawing um, these um, potential universally bounded lattices now. And while I'm drawing, you can think of um, the question, which of those is actually a universally bounded lattice. And then I'm explaining um, the solution. So the first candidate looks like this. Um, we have A here and then two security classes B and C and the fourth one D here. Then another candidate looks like this, like this where we have um, three security classes, foo and bar and bass, like this. Candidate number three looks like this. We have A on the top, then two down here called B and C, two more called D and E, and they are connected like this. And finally, at the bottom, another class called F. And then candidate number four um, starts with zero at the bottom. Then we have one, then we have two, then we have three. And this goes on and on and on um, for forever. So now the question is, which of these four are actually universally bounded lattices? And the answer is that the first one is because it has all the properties that we that we need. Um, the same is true for the second one. But number three is not a universally bounded lattice. And the reason is that there is no least upper bound um, uh, operator, or at least there's no way to define it. So if you, if you would like to define it, then you'll um, see that if you um, try to combine D and E, it's um, not clear at all what would be the least upper bound of these um, two elements. There are three common upper bounds. of D and E, namely um, A, B, and C. But um, the way we have defined this partial order through the arrows here, none of them is actually the least upper bound. So there is no single least upper bound. And as a result, um, we cannot define this um, least upper bound operator. And this means that um, this example three is not a universally bounded lattice. All right, now, and finally, what about candidate number four? Well, the problem is this infinity here. So one of the um, properties of a universally bounded lattice is that it has an upper bound, but here, because of this infinity, we do not have an upper bound. So again, this is actually not a universally bounded lattice. All right, so what these lattices are doing is to tell us which security classes exist and how they relate to each other. Now we can use those to define an information flow policy, which basically specifies the secrecy of values and which flows are allowed between these values. And such a policy consists of three things. The first one is a lattice of security classes. So the kind of thing that we've um, just seen. And then we also need to define uh, the sources of secret information. So basically, um, places in the program where some value gets one of these um, security classes that is not the one at the bottom. And we also need to define a set of untrusted things, which are basically places in the program where we do not want any secret information to flow to. 
And then the goal of the analysis given such a policy is to ensure that there's no flow from a source to a sink. Um, looking back at um, the example that we've seen earlier, so the credit card example again, we could define the source um, as the secret value, the credit card number, this one, two, three, four. And we could, for example, define a sink as this variable visible. And, and then basically the policy is saying, hey, we have two classes, in this case, public and private, and we do not want any information from anything labeled with public, um, namely this um, number one, two, three, four, to flow to an untrusted sink, namely um, this variable visible. So in theory, um, we are now done because we have specified how an information flow policy looks like. And we could now in principle just run an analysis and check if a program violates this policy. Now, if you wanted to do this in practice, then what we would probably find is that there are a lot of violations of the information flow policies. And the reason is that sometimes in a program, you may have propagations of these um, security classes that are a violation of the information flow policy, but are still intended because the program is doing something that is okay to do. So this simple no flow from high to low kind of policy isn't um, really practical and, and we need to refine it a little bit. And this kind of refinement um, is typically done through something called declassification, where the idea is that um, we have some mechanism to reduce or lower the security class of some value at particular code locations. So for example, suppose you have a piece of code that checks a password against a hash value and then does something depending on whether the password was correct or not. So in this case, you would probably have some variable that stores that password and that variable would probably be labeled um, with a high security class, so let's say secret. And then we are computing the hash of the password and compare this hash against um, some value. So strictly speaking, this entire Boolean that results here will also be have to be labeled with secret. And because this conditional is labeled with secret, this would mean that everything we do here, so where we continue with the normal program execution, or everything that we do here, where we display a message saying that the password was incorrect, would be done um, um, under this secret condition, meaning that um, everything we do here also will be secret. But of course, this is not what you want to do. You just want this check of the password to be secret. And to achieve this, um, you can use something called declassification, where we are re removing or at least lowering the security class of, um, of this hash value that we are computing. So you could basically say that this hash, fun hash function is um, a kind of declassification. And by doing this, you can still use information flow analysis and propagate security labels through your program, but at particular um, code locations like this one, um, yeah, not, not um, make everything secret, but instead tell the analysis to um, yeah, ignore this breach of the security at this particular location. All right, and this is already the end of uh, part two of this lecture on information flow analysis. You hopefully now know how to specify an information flow policy, which basically tells an information flow analysis what exactly it should check, namely that no information um, that comes from some source um, propagates to some sink according to a lattice that describes the different security classes that we have. And now in the uh, third and final part of the lecture, we will look into how an analysis can actually check this kind of property. So thank you very much for listening and see you in the third part.